Good morning, good morning. It's 1015. Let's not punish the prompt. We'll go ahead and start on time. Uh, my name is Mike Wyatt, and I am a director in Deloitte Cyber Services Practice. I spend a, the, last, the last three to four years, most of what I've done uh, is show up to good states where bad things have happened. Right? So the state of Utah lost a third of their citizens' information due to a, an incident or a breach. And right when that project was wrapping up, uh, South Carolina had a situation where 80% of their citizens uh, lost tax records going back a decade. Not just some PII or PHI, but, but the whole, uh, whole tax returns, right? So uh, in both cases, the governors had to come out and apologize for those situations. And uh, we never want to serve the state of California in the way we've served those other states, okay? Uh, one of our other parts of the practice, and I have with me Linus, and Linus, I'll ask you to introduce yourself in just a second, is, is disaster relief and disaster management, right? So we spent a lot of time helping states like Louisiana after uh, Katrina and Colorado after the floods that they experienced a couple of years ago in the city of Joplin, Missouri. And it's interesting because there are many lessons learned from dealing with crisis level situations that are applicable to the context of, of cyber risk and, and uh, cyber response. And so what we wanna do today is blend that discussion together, talk about some lessons learned. And I've certainly had firsthand experiencing what's worked and what has not worked at, uh, at a couple of states. Uh, and again, luckily, not, 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 not the one we're in today, okay? Linus? Linus Okano, I'm a senior manager with Deloitte. Unlike Mike, I am not a cyber guy like he said. However, like Mike, I do show up in places after bad things have happened. As he alluded to, I've done a lot of work in the Gulf states helping with uh, their disaster recovery uh, efforts, especially in the aftermaths of Hurricane Katrina, Rita, Gustav and Ike, and currently also with the state of Colorado in response to some of the flooding incidents that happened in 2013. Um, as Mike also very well alluded to, there is such a, a great deal of overlap in terms of what you experience, what challenges you face, um, and also what things you can do right and lessons learned um, from these kinds of crisis experiences. Uh, and over the last uh, eight years, it's been my good fortune to really serve clients and really helping them at their worst hour uh, and really just really helping them drive towards resiliency. How do we rebuild? How do we get uh, to improve things better? Uh, one of the things that I've absolutely found out to be true is that you cannot control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to it. Uh, and I hope that some of the things that we're able to accomplish today with you is to share sort of leading practices as well as also lessons learned and how we can help um, whether it's states or uh, commercial entities really do a better job in terms of responding but also building resilience so that in future incidents, because they always do happen, you're better prepared and you're better uh, responsive to those kinds of situations. Excellent. All right. We'll see if this actually works. Okay. So let's talk about what, what is a crisis? How do we define a crisis, right? It's, it's a term that we find, depending upon who you ask, you get a lot of uh, different answers. Uh, what's in a cyber incident response plan? What are the components of it? Uh, lessons learned from, from not only cyber incident response activities that other states have had to go through, but again, from, from natural disaster and recovery efforts there. And we'll talk about a, a framework we call the chaos framework. Okay, so a crisis is something that is not an incident, not a traditional event. It is something that has to be dealt with organization-wide. And there are a variety of different components. And at this point, normally I would be walking around and pointing things out, but I'll, I'll attempt to do that close to the microphone today. Right, the, the first piece is that, that there's something complex that's happened. It's not isolated to a, a single small system, something that can be handled by a team using an incident response plan, right? It, it's something that's very disruptive uh, organizationally, right? Whether it's, it's a financial system, uh, a power outage, or a loss of a significant amount of uh, information, uh, something quite disruptive. Uh, there are a, a lot of ramifications. You know, the, 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 the challenge that states have is that everything is public information. And you have not only the agency head and the agency staff that have to deal with it, 
You have a governor that has to be involved if it's big enough. And you have the legislature who's here to help. Right? So you, you deal with that. And then there's media. And that is different. Many times in the commercial world, something can happen and there, it can be contained within the four walls for a period of time. So there can be consultation and analysis and you just don't have that privilege in state. Everything's above the fold. Right? And so that, that adds an additional level of complexity, much like a natural disaster where everything's being reported, media is involved, it's very, very visible and, and quite public. Okay? So there are a variety of different kinds of crises. We're going to focus primarily on cyber today, but again, draw some analogies and lessons learned from uh, natural disasters. And um, I tell you, we, we are certainly seeing um, a lot of concern now about uh, man-made disasters that, that go beyond just theft of information, right? I, I think we're seeing an escalation in cyber attacks where we're seeing critical infrastructure uh, potentially being taken out, uh, and, and that is a concern because now we're moving into risk of, of, of life and limb, which again has analogies into the natural disaster side. Yeah. Interestingly, also the same things happening as, as it goes with natural disasters. Obviously, you get to see them on the news. Uh, and so there's a greater frequency of occurrence, but also at the same time a greater uh, scale of magnitude and impact. Um, over the last 20 years, we've seen a very rapid escalation in the number of presidentially declared disasters uh, on the federal government level um, that deal with states. Uh, but even within that context of states, we're seeing states that traditionally aren't the recipients, if I could use that phrase, of natural disaster events actually begin to experience them. Typically when we think of natural disasters, our natural cadence has been towards the Gulf states or Florida uh, or even California with potential for earthquakes uh, and fires, but you're seeing more and more things moving inland. Colorado with the flooding um, and, and snowstorms. Um, again, it's just really escalating, it's really evolving, and so more and more uh, there's a greater need for uh, organizations, both state, public, private, to really be prepared, to really have a firm grasp and understanding of the challenges, of the issues, and uh, better be able to pre prepare and respond uh, to those things as they present themselves. So from a, a leadership perspective, a crisis presents some, some unique challenges. One of which is there, there oftentimes is a tendency to focus on fixing the incident as opposed to being in front of the organization and leading through the crisis response. Um, we, 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 we've seen this uh, certainly in cyber, and I, I think there are plenty of examples from natural disasters where uh, leadership made some, some decisions that led the organization down a path that cost a lot of money or cost credibility loss that really could have been avoided had they had gone through a scenario and exercised uh, what it would be like to go through an incident. Because of lack of preparation, the first time they lived through the incident was the incident itself or the crisis itself. And you, you, that's not a good situation. You don't want on-the-job learning for this particular type of situation. Uh, the, Mary talks a lot about the speed, and uh, in particular, of cyber events. Uh, the, the, the scale, breadth, and depth, and nature of events oftentimes is miscalculated, and we see that a lot. Oh, the, the, the federal government breach most recently, it seems like every day we get some, or every week we get new information on the breadth, depth, and nature of that particular breach. That's a challenge with this. A lot of times it takes time to understand what has actually happened. And there needs to be an understanding by all involved that you're going to have incomplete and, and actually incorrect information in the first 24 hours of the crisis. And, and, and knowing that, manage the message to the public and to the media and to other constituents in the legislature or the governor's office that you, you will have some situational information to start with, but it will change. And it could look very, very different in three days or five days than what it does at the beginning. And um, I, 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 think, I think a lot of times we, we do use Stephen Covey's analogy, it's not necessarily what happens to you, it's how you respond to it. That's never more true than in a crisis. And by managing that message more carefully, you can prepare the people that are listening and wanting that information uh, to understand that, that it will change and that that's not a, a negative reflection on on what was initially communicated. Okay. Um, we see inaccurate decision making a lot of times because of this desire to either have complete information 
which is unrealistic, or, or acting in haste with limited information. And a lot of times, again, that's because there, there's not been thought given to what does it mean in a typical type of scenario, right? What does the decision tree look like? How do we arrive at the decision effectively? Who needs to be involved in the decision making? You know, if the, the Sony situation was interesting, they actually pulled the plug from the internet, right? Disconnected the corporation from the internet. Maybe that was a good thing, maybe it wasn't. Uh, but if you don't go through the scenario of understanding what it would be like to have a massive crisis level, not incident level, a crisis level situation regarding cyber response or environmental disaster, uh, the decisions may very well turn out uh, not to be the best ones. Right? Uh, and there is a lot, a lot of times there's a chaotic flow of information. And if you don't put processes in place to manage that flow of information, you're putting yourself even further behind the eight ball and making as good a decision as you can with the information available. Okay. Um, the common phrase, you know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail is very much true in this kinds of situations. Uh, because again, you have to make that thoughtful process and that frontline investment of making sure that you have the right processes, the right infrastructure, um, and the right conception of how crisis and incidents might actually evolve uh, because it doesn't always happen as it does in the textbook. One of the things I do on the side is I, I, uh, I'm an adjunct faculty and one of the things I have to remind my students is the things we teach you from the textbook are true and the factual, however, they are only fit for the classroom because in the real world things actually don't happen this way. And the very same thing is true about crisis and cyber incidents is that, you know, there are a lot of things that we talk about, there are a lot of things that we know, that we think, that we perceive can happen, but that's not always exactly the same script that's going to be followed by the crisis or by the event. Um, so again, you can be a really fine actor, but you also have to be uh, flexible to, to respond to the crowd or a comedian, to respond to how they, uh, how things are playing out that's a little bit beyond your control. One of the things also that I just want to add real quickly, I think sometimes when people face that challenge of having incomplete or inaccurate data, um, they choose to not make a decision or temper down their decision making and quite often that is the wrong thing to do. Um, there's a saying that you cannot not communicate, so when you try not to talk to someone, remember with your little brother or your sister or your parents, you tried not to say anything but you really are saying something by not saying something. Same thing happens when you choose not to make a decision, you are actually taking an action one way or another that has trickle down implications and impacts. So I think being really prepared and being making sure that you're doing the right things at all times is absolutely critical for making it through any of these incidents. All right, this is a busy slide. We're not going to drain it, I assure you. Uh, but I do want to point out a, a few different areas. The first is if you just accept the fact that something's going to happen, Right? Just acknowledge that something will happen. We don't know exactly what, we don't know to what scale, but something is going to happen, then you can make a decision with scarce resources to invest in a few things that you know you will need. One of the biggest problems during a, a, a true crisis is the inability to communicate. Right? You have to have a way to manage the information that's occurring during the crisis and make sure it's being shared with the appropriate stakeholders and not shared with people who don't need to have it at that point in time, right? So having, uh, being able to, to, uh, to gather the information, analyze it, and disseminate it appropriately, you have to have processes in place and oftentimes systems in place, and those systems need to be resilient because in there, if you have a major cyber incident and there's no internet access, right? I mean, just completely dark, then how are you gonna communicate, right? Or if the cell network is down, how do you communicate? A lot of scenarios have assumptions that you'll be able to make phone calls or you'll be able to con contact people in traditional ways and when those systems are not available, the plan can fall apart. So part of the scenario planning or wargaming, you need to uh, uh, think about situations where your normal communication mechanisms are not in play and what you want to do as a, as a mitigating uh, control for that, right? Uh, also, there needs to be continual monitoring uh, in a crisis, there needs to be inbound information, not just about the, the particular crisis issue, but what's happening in social media, what's happening with, with uh, uh, commercial media, um, and, and having some situational awareness of the messages going out so that if there is wrong information, the appropriate people can help correct that, again, while this crisis is unfolding and, and, and moving into management. Um, there need to be people that, that understand 
um, the, the role in the response. And not everybody's cut out to do this work. And if you haven't been through, not a tabletop, but a real simulation where you have tested people with, with uh, artificially induced stress to see how they will behave and react under severe pressure, um, you, you don't really know what, how things will turn out. So again, that's another, another reason why the people that will be involved in a response need to go through some vetting to make sure they're the right people uh, to do that and to understand how they'll behave. And, and, and it will also help them. It's like media training. Before somebody at Deloitte's allowed to be interviewed on television, we have to go through media training where we get interviewed and interrogated and they try to make us look bad, right? And, and it, is, it is a tough, tough situation, but far better to do that there than to have to do it in front of the live media of the of, you know, local or national news, okay? Uh, there has to be a plan. And I, this, this you know, sounds so obvious. And, and a lot of times there are plans, but the plans are inadequate, they're stale, they're not communicated. Uh, they're, in a, they're in a construct that you can't use during a crisis, right? Um, a lot of times I've seen just uh, continuity operations plans, coop plans that are like this, right? Uh, in a crisis, you're not going to have everybody have, take the binders and pass the binders out and, and try to find my section of it, right? That's an ineffective plan. So the plans need to be fit for purpose. They need to be tailored for the stakeholders that are going to use their portion of the plan, right? And they have to be maintained and they have to be practiced, right? You have to have some muscle memory there. Yeah. I think one thing to really stress on that is in the heat of the moment, dealing with an incident, dealing with a crisis, there really should not be any hesitation to refer to those playbooks and to those processes and to those manuals. But also at the same time, there shouldn't be a marriage to them that you're afraid to toss them out when the rules don't apply. Uh, the way I try to frame it is, if you're playing a game and you know what the rules are, at least you know what the written rules are, but you recognize that the refs aren't making calls about a certain play or the auditors aren't looking about a certain thing, well that informs your decision making, right? So it means they don't care about that or they don't care as much about that and I can allocate my resources more efficiently and effectively into another area. Likewise, when you recognize within uh, the moment of the incident of a crisis that, look, we don't have a playbook for this or it's not fitting to the script, don't be afraid to throw it out and actually come up with something. Again, using those same principles as we've outlined in here, using those same principles and those same driving factors, uh, don't be afraid to toss out the playbook and actually do something that actually works as opposed to, to do something that you were told to do. Yeah, we, we in state government are very egalitarian, right? And, and we a lot of times want to drive to consensus about things. A crisis is not the time to, uh, to really focus on that particular characteristic of, of uh, government. There has to be a command and control structure to manage through the crisis. And this is where uh, uh, the, the military, lessons learned from military and how, how to manage through a, a situation or in the case of Mary Gallion, talking about her time in the FBI, is helpful, right? Because there has to be clear decision-making authority, who is going to make the call, who is going to communicate to whom, when it's going to happen. That has to be very, very clear. And, and you don't want to be deciding that on the fly in the, in the heat of the moment, all right? Uh, also, there has to be a process on how to make the decisions and, and who will be involved. And those are closely tied to one another. I've already talked about communications. Uh, a lot of times from a response perspective, depending upon the nature of the crisis, the resources may not be at the ready or available in the state because the, the resources needed to manage the crisis may be the same resources that are trying to resolve the incident. And there's only one of those, there's a scarce number. Uh, we're seeing states like Florida put uh, zero dollar retainers in place for specialized skill sets that they know they're going to need ahead of time so that when something happens, they pull out the playbook, they, they have the call tree, including third parties, including uh, third party vendors to bring in to help with certain aspects of the crisis response effort, okay? All right. Let's talk a little bit more from a, a disaster perspective, right, uh, about lessons, lessons learned. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the U.S. Congress um, set up a committee to investigate what happened or didn't happen, you may argue, um, within uh, Hurricane Katrina and the days uh, leading up to and the days following it. 
the title of the uh, report that was issued back to Congress was called A Failure of Initiative. An initiative speaks to decision making. And as you can see in this quote, one of the biggest challenges that they faced and one of the biggest failures that they had was a failure of decision making. Ga Mayor, Mayor Galligan talked about, you know, what are your crown jewels? Um, in a state facing a hurricane situation, your crown jewels are the lives of your citizens. And above all else, you should do whatever it takes that's necessary to not only protect them, but to keep them away from harm. I don't think anyone would beat you up after the fact if the hurricane didn't pan out the way it was supposed to, and you'd spent so much money evacuating people. However, if you didn't do which they had challenges with in making that timely decision about when to evacuate people and how to leverage the resources. Again, Amtrak was providing services where they could have easily evacuated people from uh, New Orleans in a timely fashion uh, prior to la uh, the hurricane making landfall. But again, it was this back and forth of who's going to make the decision. Should it be the mayor? of New Orleans, should it be the governor? And then when you add into that the complexity of stakeholders from the state military, uh, the National Guard, uh, FEMA, uh, as well as also other federal agencies that had insight and effort into uh, uh, disaster relief for Louisiana and uh, Hurricane Katrina, someone needed to step up and lead decisively. And so when it's about leading decisively, it's always, again, what are the primary goals and objectives? In the case of Katrina, the primary goal and objective should have been keeping people safe, and the way to keep them safe was having them evacuated. Again, the city could be damaged, infrastructure could be damaged, but the one thing that you can never replace is human life. Uh, but again, this has to be something that's done beforehand, and so there has to be really clear understanding and really clear protocols about how things should happen. And then, again, if you are faced with multiple decisions or a plethora of decisions, go back to that concept of crown jewels, right? What are your crown jewels? What are your priority risks? And then make decisions that minimize the impact of loss against your crown jewels. Yeah, yes, sir. You never have the lady, the manager who shut down the path trains that were going under the World Trade Center. All of her upper management was telling her to start the trains up again. And she said that. She ended up making the right decision. But everybody above her that she answered to couldn't grasp it. And the two buildings are blown up and burning, and they're like, well, just keep the trains running. Yeah. yeah. Katrina was the same thing. You had people who were unable to make a decision because they were afraid. And, and it, that's a really good point, the fear of being wrong, because unfortunately, again, in, in state government, it's, it's really tough, right? It, everything, is, everything is public. Uh, we, we oftentimes need to uh, blame storm and, and, you know, make sure that somebody pays for the mistakes that were made. Uh, I think that, that by accepting the fact that you're going to have a crisis and going through this process and acknowledging that fact and understanding that we have to agree collectively that decisions will be made and then executive leadership, governor, agency heads, have to, have to commit to giving you air cover to be wrong, but yet make the decision in, in the crisis is absolutely critical. It's a tone at the top issue. And, and that's why we, we try to call this out as being different. This is not like when there's, there's just a, a problem with a, a, a particular system and benefits can't be provided. This is something that's very wide scale and you have to have the air coverage. And you really don't have that conversation outside of a very serious scenario planning with the upper leadership in the room going through the process so that they can feel the heat of it too. Okay. Uh, I, I look at what happened in, in Utah uh, and in, in a lot of the things that, that we've talked about uh, in, in the context of that response, lives were not at risk. But decisions were made that cost the state a lot of money, potentially more so than, uh, than was necessary, because they didn't have a really good response plan in place. When the system, when it was discovered that somebody was on the system and doing something with it, the actions and steps taken destroyed evidence, uh, uh, caused further disruption to the infrastructure, and so forth. And it was, it was all in good intent. 
Um, but because they didn't have a playbook, they hadn't gone through it, they didn't know the steps for evidence preservation, um, it, it made it very, very difficult to determine exactly what had happened. And so therefore, they had to take the most conservative view and provide credit monitoring and everything else for a lot of people. And, and what originally was thought to have happened when we showed up to do the forensic work and what we believe happened later uh, was completely different. And so that information that you get in the first few hours or few days being completely wrong, um, that, that's an, you know, that was just held true certainly there. Okay, just watching the time, so I'm gonna go ahead and keep, keep moving through. Uh, situational awareness is key. Um, when crisis unfold, it doesn't unfold as pictures. And what I mean by that, it's not static. At the same time, you might think it unfolds like a movie, which is somewhat accurate, but consider that a movie, you're only seeing one scene play out at a time. It's really a series of movies with multiple lenses and multiple cameras taking on on multiple screens at the same time. Have you seen those movies where you've got the different windows and different things are going on and how hard it is to follow? That's a pretty good analogy. So you actually need that intelligence to be able to see all these things as they're happening, being able to link the impacts as of, of all these things, figure out what is relevant, figure out what is not, figure out what is really going to drive or inform your decision making, figure out what is accurate information, what is junk, figure out what is uh, something that can actually inspire and rally people to positive action, and what are the things that actually might actually cause them to cower and actually flee as opposed to stay, stand their ground and actually help you drive some of the information decisions that you have to make. And so what it does require of leadership and of individuals who are charged with responding or dealing with crises and incidents is that you are able to quickly analyze the situation. You get information, incomplete or inaccurate as it may be, and come to a decision fairly quickly. Again, the challenge is you don't have time to waste. You cannot afford to not make a decision. You have to make a decision, but there has to be a conviction that supports that decision making. And the conviction comes with, I am ready, I am prepared, I have taken information, I have filtered out what's junk and what's trash, and I am willing to stand by that because, again, I am driving towards what's the greatest impact towards my organization. You know, if you look at what happened with Target, one of the biggest challenges were that, that information that hit the news and shoppers are in the store and they're asking the cashiers, well, is it okay to pay with a credit card? And the cashiers didn't, know, didn't, didn't have a script, didn't have a, there had not been communications down to that level. The call centers, right, didn't have the information that was coming out. The media was out in front of this. And you just don't want to be in that position. And, and I think, again, with state government, it's, it's all, the, all the tougher because of how transparent and visible everything is. Um, I, 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 I think the, the, a lot of times, those of you who have dealt on the IT side, when there's a problem, an outage, what do we do? Well, let's have a conference bridge and let's get updates every 10 minutes, right? And uh, how many times are the people that are actually trying to solve the problem tied up in overhead, reporting out, reporting up? Basically, we don't know anything more than we did 10 minutes ago. But, but that, that kind of uh, structure is not helpful. It's, it's really not appropriate. So thinking through the types of communication that are really necessary and needed and letting the people who need to focus on the incident, focus on the incident, and let the other folks focus on the broader crisis management team and don't try to get people doing double duty. Those are different roles and responsibilities. Okay. Okay, this is one of my favorites because we live in a very social media age. Um, and everybody is in essence a media personality in terms of they are actually able to report news. And I would also argue, again, from a personal lens, that there is this groupthink mindset. Oh my god, somebody tweeted this, it must be true, as opposed to challenging the credibility of the source. It all comes down to, if you're not driving the conversation, someone else is. It's almost like Wall Street. You can choose to not put out estimates for your quarterly uh, performance or for your annual results, guess what? They're going to do it for you. So you might as well get in the game and really drive and direct the information that's put out there. Because again, like I said, if you don't do it, media will do it for you. But it's even worse than that, like I said, because we live in a very social media age, 
people, individuals who are not as educated, who are not as sophisticated, who are not as experienced in the incident or in the disaster, or coming from it with a very myopic or a very peculiar lens of it, will put out information that ultimately causes harm, not just to your organization, but at the end of the day, upends your recovery uh, initiatives. Yeah, I think, I think one of the challenges in state government is that there are a lot of stakeholders that will be communicating directly with members in the, uh, in the assembly in the, in the state senate, uh, providing their, their input. So, so, so you have a lot of people who are wanting to help right when you're trying to deal with uh, a particular situation. So it's just something to have situational awareness of, for sure. One, uh, thing, one thing to add on that real quickly, I, I know you, you made a good point about picking and being careful about who is in front of the cameras or who is, is telling the story. I think also it's likewise important to understand the audience who will be receiving that information, to empathize with them and speak a language that they understand. Because again, there's a lot of, especially when you come to, into the cyber world, there's a lot of technical mumbo jumbo to a layperson that's being said is like, okay, great, what does that really mean? At the end of the day, think in a very humanistic, psychological way. People care about how does this affect me? How does this impact me? To the target customer who is standing in front of a checkout line, can I pay with my credit card? Should I pay with my credit card? Should I stop shopping at Target and go across the street to Walmart? It could be very, very binary like that to individuals. And so I think it's very important to understand, again, from the perception of the person who will be receiving the information that you're putting out there, that it's something that they understand. It's something that relates personally to them that actually causes them to care about what you're saying. And, and by the way, agency PIOs, right, may not be the right people. Right? I, I will give Governor Herbert a lot of credit when the situation occurred in Utah. He got out in front of the media and he, he didn't blame storm, he didn't point the finger, he said, we've had the situation, I apologize, and we will make it right. And, and that, that, you can contrast that with other leaders in other states, not, not South Carolina, I'm going to be clear about that, in other states that have had is, issues where they, they came out and start blame storming, right? Well, the agency shouldn't have sent me that data unencrypted it's their fault yeah that is the that that lack of taking some risk not not saying necessarily it's my fault but apologizing and saying we're going to make it better and having that that executive leadership presence sending that message makes a lot of difference right planning we've talked a lot about planning and interestingly enough there was a hurricane exercise as it related to PAM that was actually performed prior to Katrina taking place. However, the problem with that plan was it was very traditional. Again, we're taking off of what has happened in the past and using that to apply to incidents that will potentially happen in the future. I don't like it when I read this on a prospectus, but it's very true in crisis incidents, right? Your investment broker tells you, you know, historical performance is no indication of future performance. It's very true in crisis. I hope it's not because I don't like it when I hear it from my investment broker, but it's very true, which is plan definitely, but don't plan for the past. Expect the unexpected. One of the things I always challenge people to do is to think about what nobody is thinking about what everybody sees. That sounds like a lot, but let me explain. Think about what nobody's thinking about that which everybody sees, which really goes to say everybody sees something and can perceive something, but nobody's really making the connections. No one's connecting the dots. We know that there is a problem with the levy system, that we really haven't upgraded them in the last 30 or 40 years. There were reports, as there are many today, about the public infrastructure that we have across America. There are reports about our level of preparedness at all levels of government, at the federal, at the state, at the local, and the level of coordination among them. So again, none, none of the things, and if you go back and you spend the wonderful time of reading the over 580 something pages of the congressional report, nothing in there is new. Nothing in there was, oh my God, I didn't know this before. There were reports, there were different things that indicated those things were going on, but again, it's having that foresight of being able to connect the dots and put things together to really start to expect the unexpected. Most of the time, the things that we think are unexpected are actually expected if we're taking the time to actually challenge our traditional assumptions and perceptions. Yeah, I, I think that that lesson is never more true than with, with the, the cyber side of things, right? Every time we figure out how to get one door locked, 
the adversary figures out some other way to get in. And, and as long as there's value in the data that we process and store, then there will be attempts to take it and do something with it, right? Or it, from a, a hacktivist standpoint to disrupt uh, the, the systems and the environment. And so until we can demonetize it and devalue it where it's just not interesting anymore, we're gonna have to, to deal with you know, people's day jobs. You know, they make a lot of money trying to steal our information, right? So, so given that, uh, what, what has worked today, the countermeasures, the, the mitigating controls today are gonna have to change, and, and there's never enough money, <laughs> and there's never enough resource and enough time to, to protect everything you'd like to protect. Uh, and so from a, a crisis preparation standpoint, knowing those critical systems just even having a good asset inventory, it's interesting. There are a lot of continuity of operation plans in place. Uh, but a lot of them are not tied to the disaster recovery plans where they're linked. So that if something, if something bad happens, and this isn't necessarily a cyber issue, but, but let's just say a natural disaster, buildings flooded, can't use it, systems have been taken out, we're in a recovery mode, exactly how will the mission of the organization be able to continue? Uh, and if those plans aren't linked, right, the IT side and the business side, then it's, it's, it, it's gonna be pretty rough. And you don't wanna have to feel your way through the dark in those situations, for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's talk about this particular piece, conflicting information. Again, you really want to get down to actionable intelligence. You will get, as we have stated numerous times in this presentation, and as you will hear uh, from different other presenters, is that you will always have different sources of information with different levels of credibility. You will never overcome that heap of information that's coming back at you. In Hurricane uh, Katrina, for example, one of the biggest challenges is you had perspective from different people. You had the media with the helicopters doing the flyovers telling you visually what's going on. We see streets flooded, we see people on rooftops. You had the first level responders, people on boats, people going house to house, door to door, trying to see if there are survivors in there. There's another perspective of people who are actually in the Superdome, um, who again are cut off largely from the rest of what's going on in there. However, a different crisis is brewing in there because there's a shortage of supplies, there's a shortage of sanitary conditions, and there's just that flat out, I don't know what's going on outside the dome, literally. And then there's you who's sitting in here on, in your home, making sense of what you're seeing, using your prior experiences. Oh, I used to be uh, in New Orleans before, and I think this is what is. You can never have the control over how much information comes through. What, however, you should be able to do is if you spend the right level of investment and time and effort is really building through a system and a set of protocols of how do I sift through these? Right. How do I assign levels of credibility to the sources of information that I'm getting? And then how do I over time assess that continuing credibility? Just because someone was credible one time doesn't mean they're always going to be credible. Just because someone tweeted or blogged something that was accurate doesn't mean every single time I go back to that source. Some sources are better for some types of information, but typically not all sources are always correct. So again, it's that juxtaposition and sort of building that confidence matrix, if you will, to the different sources of information and the levels of veracity that you can attach to what they're giving to you at the time. One important thing is, almost without exception, uh, there's going to be uh, post-mortem. On, on, on what decisions were made, how they were made, how the organization responded. And so you're not gonna necessarily need to record all the inbound information, but how you make the decisions and being able to explain that, especially if you have to go in front of you know, a, a commission or, or in front of the Senate or in front of the assembly and, and, and explain why you did what you did or why your organization did what they did, there needs to be a decision log, right? You need to take the time during the pro process, and it doesn't need to be elaborate, but you do need to have that log of what decisions were made when, and, 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 and some context about how that decision was made, okay? We just have a few more minutes, and uh, I, I think what we'll do is, is just quickly run through this particular slide. 
Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll say when it comes to preparing, I think a couple of big things in there, again, is do not just rely on traditional preparation efforts. Really, if you can, challenge the underlying assumptions behind the decisions that you're choosing to, to, to place yourself with your incidents plan or with your crisis management uh, effort. Scenario plan, think through multiple iterations, multiple permutations, but again, don't be afraid to take it down to very simple basic human instincts and ask how will people behave in a chaos situation because sometimes it doesn't always fit what you see in the textbook. And then when you respond, respond timely, respond decisively, respond effectively. But then also take that time, as Mike said, uh, post-mortem if you can, and, and capture those critical decision points that you're making during the crisis so that, again, you can go back and perform a root cause analysis and say, OK, this was a downfall, but is this symptomatic of a bigger, more pervasive issue? And then apply evolutionary learning of saying, OK, we want to be resilient. We want to learn from this so that this will not happen or similar incarnation of this particular issue. All right. I uh, want to leave you with an acronym that, that Mary Galligan brought to the firm um, when, when she joined us. So, a chaos framework is actually quite helpful, and I'm sorry it's a little bit hard to read, so I'm going to read this out, right? So communications, right? The C is for communications. You need that formal and informal network. How are you going to have information uh, managed, and where's it going to come from? Up and down and left to right uh, in a crisis. Have a plan. Practice the plan. Rehearse. War game. Simulate that plan. Act on it. Use it actually go use the plan when a crisis hits. Sometimes we've seen situations where all this planning went into place, but it wasn't used. And, and it became very ad hoc and quite messy. Um, you have to own the crisis. You have to be out in front of the message. Again, state government, it's, it's never more critical. Uh, because if you don't, somebody else will be. And, and then after, after return to normal operations, understand the lessons learned and incorporate that into future cycles, right? Okay. With that, we have like all of three minutes uh, if there are any, any questions or feedback. Okay, uh, I'll leave you a couple, just one, other, one or two other thoughts. Uh, this is an enterprise risk management issue. It is not an IT information security issue. Um, it, it's something we deal with a lot. A lot of agency leaders are, are like, look, if it's, if it's information security, that's an IT problem. It's, it's uh, CISO and CIO. Why are we having a conversation about it? It is an enterprise risk management issue. It certainly isn't commercial, right? When governors have to come and apologize that something's happened, that's an enterprise risk management issue, just like a natural disaster is. The other piece is, if you're asking for funding, don't ask for funding for anything related to information security. Ask for cyber, because cyber gets funding. Cyber is an enterprise risk term. Every bill in Congress says cyber. Most state, state legislatures will use the term cyber. That is something that resonates with people who aren't in IT. And a lot of information security people hate that, because not every security issue is cyber. It is if you want funding. So just that's my, my tip for the day. And I hope this has been helpful for you.